The devil tried to kill her many times. She has a lot of testimonies I want her to share. Her whole story is amazing by God's grace. Karen Reeves is a live hard patriot and a minister. She was birthed out of the Brownsville revival in 1998. She has seen many, many out of the box God moments. And she's had you know, many miraculous supernatural encounters as well. Um, she gave her life to Christ at the age of six, but then she walked away as an agnostic only to return to Christ back at the age of 36, gave her life to the Lord. She has a ministry. My God, I'm telling you, I'm so excited to have her on. Karen, you have been stompled on by 1100 pound horse. You were almost killed by a bull. You were beaten to death. Literally, you had an out-of-body experience by one of your ex-boyfriends who almost, who killed you and you came back. So I want you to talk about the supernatural realm, what you've seen, what the Lord has shown you, because you're a, you're a Holy Ghost, fire, spirit-filled woman of God that I was very fortunate enough to meet. I said, I have to interview you because you have an incredible testimony. But before we go into the encounters, what you see in the spirit, what you've seen when you had a near-death experience, talk about your background. Because the devil tried to kill you your whole life. But even when you were two years old, you were electrocuted. Way to jump into that background. Well, um, my mother told me the story. So when I was two years old, she said that she heard me screaming in the other room, you know, in the laundry room. And somehow, I guess I must have wiggled the plug loose or something. And I had my hand and my fingers in there and um, I was being electrocuted. And she grabbed a hold of me and then she got the greatest part of the jolt. And somehow we broke free. Um, you know, I know most children that something like that were to happen to them, they die. So somehow, miraculously, God had a plan long before I was even born. Amen. You know, you gave your life to the Lord at six years old. How did you make that decision? Do you remember doing that? Um, I remember always wanting to be in a church. And my mother kind of confirmed that many years later that I was always in the church. I mean, the church at that time was a Catholic church up on the hill from where we lived. And every time they were open, my mother said I was up there and I would go up there and I would pray and I would light candles and, you know, um, I just always up there. And I just remember wanting to be a nun because in those days, that's all I knew. And I knew that that was the only way as a woman that you could serve God. So I wanted, you know, I just wanted to serve Jesus at that time. And then I was nine years old and I had a nun lie about me and I almost didn't get my first con communion and my mother went up there and raised Cain and the next thing I know they gave, let me get the communion I don't even remember what it was that she said but uh, long story made short I walked away you know I was like how could a nun lie about me because I didn't do whatever it was I knew it mm. so I spent a lot of years wandering and I just have to look at it that God allowed that to happen because God is in control and he allows things and he'll pull, pull you back at the right time and he's always there to take and protect you and i gave him permission yeah. when i was six when i asked him in you know when i when i wanted to serve him that was my giving him permission and it's so important that when a child gets to know god gets to know jesus that and it's that real for them you know that real commitment then god has permission to intervene in your life and keep, that he keeps you protected you know, and, and he definitely kept me protected. Amen. You know, God is in control in mm -hmm. the heavenly realm. Obviously he's got control in this world too, but he gave us dominion. He gave us the authority and the control here, even though of course the devil can't do anything unless he gets permission, but humans have free will. And so obviously the nun, well, right. unfortunately she stumbled you and that's not the will of God. That was, you know, that's something she has to ask the Lord for to forgive her for, because really um, that's not good. The Lord, the Bible says, do not stumble a child or else. Mm -hmm. Better that, you know, you have a noose tied around your neck, a millstone tied around your neck. So a way to jump into, um, before we go into how you came back to the Lord, because you've had a lot of encounters with the enemy. Mm -hmm. Actually, look, yeah. when you were a teen, you dabbled in witchcraft and, and you, mm -hmm. you were also, you were open about this. You were abused physically, sexually. I want you to talk more about your background. Then we'll talk about the witchcraft and then the near death experience. Okay. Well, as, as a child, you know, I had a babysitter and it was a woman, a teenager, and that didn't go well. And I didn't want to go be babysat anymore. 
Um, it was sexual assaults. Um, I had a, I just had a lot of bad encounters and I didn't get along well with my mother. My parents were divorced when I was three. I mean, my dad's had seven marriages. My mother's had four and there's like 20, I think 25 kids, siblings, somewhere in there all mixed up at different times if you added them all up. So, um, you know, when I was nine, I just wanted to go live with my dad and I had a big argument with my mother and I packed up a big suitcase. I bounced it on a bicycle and said goodbye to my step grandfather and got in on my bicycle and started pedaling. And she found me about my five miles down the road at about 11 o'clock at night and brought me back and my brother was crying and she beat me for making him cry. So, you know, things just were really always some kind of tense in a lot of ways. My mother was much of a perfectionist and everything was her way or the highway in a lot of ways. She wasn't real loving and I've learned recently and a few years ago in taking in my mom and taking care of her with dementia and she's in a nursing home at this point because it just got to that level but for a while there I had her staying with me and I led her to the Lord I led her mother to the Lord years ago and um, she started talking about the fact that she had to forgive her mother and then that's where it came out where her mother used to beat her so it helped my understanding because her hand was often on my face and leaving an imprint but, um, you know, when I got to be 13, I had a friend and she called herself a pixie, a pixie rich, and her sister was a witch. And there was, I think the brother was a warlock, if I remember correctly. I didn't have much to do with him, but she taught me how to cast a spell. She, you know, she would travel in her spirit and leave her body and another familiar spirit, which I didn't understand it at the time, would enter into her body. And it was a whole different personality of a person. Even the tone of the voice was different. You know, the, the accent of the voice was different. Um, and when I cast a spell for the first time and it worked, I was like, it, it made me feel real uneasy because it actually did work. It, it's, it's not like it drew me to it. And I mean, I got involved with the Ouija board and anybody who thinks a Ouija board is safe is dealing with familiar spirits and you're opening doors into your life that is very difficult to close after a while. Um, got into seances with different friends. Uh, and it was, there was one where we thought we were gonna lose the gal, the one gal. And, um, you know, calling out to Jesus was the only thing that broke it. It's just like the, I used to have dreams. I started having these horrific dreams where I was just frozen and I couldn't move. I couldn't move my mouth. I couldn't. I couldn't move anything. You know, I couldn't move a muscle. And I would be dreaming, and this evil was over me, and it was penetrating. And I would have to think in my mind and really think and concentrate. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And finally, my mouth would free in the dream, and I would be able to speak the name of Jesus. And as soon as I spoke it, the whole thing broke. But there were times when I would wake up, and when I woke up, it was still all around me. But that, and, was, but, but, but that was before you gave your life to Jesus. As, as an adult, you became born again. Yeah. This is oh, like yeah. A so what kind of spells would you cast as a teen? What did they teach you to cast? I only did the one. You know, I... Like I said, I dabbled in it and um, she did a whole lot more. I cast the one and it kind of, it, I, I don't know if I want to say it freaked me out, but I didn't like the fact that I changed the will of somebody. You know, black magic is when you change the will of somebody. White magic is when you're doing things and you're, you know, you're calling on the earth and things of that nature to protect you and things of that nature. and you know, to, to make things good and prosperous. But black magic is when you're changing the will of a human being. So after that, you started having bad dreams and, and paralyzation when you're sleeping, which I've had, that's real. Had it multiple mm -hmm. times. Um, so continue from there. So you, what happened? Well, I think, I think a lot of that happened when I decided to move away from it, you know, because I wanted to move away from it because I, it just 
didn't feel right. And I wanted to move away from it. And I would wake up, I remember being 16 and waking up and black and white crosses just coming at me, coming at me, coming at me. And I couldn't see anything in my room. I could just see these crosses like flying at me. And, you know, the, the familiar spirits would follow me around and, and they were very, very, I mean, they were real. I was sitting in a social studies class one time in ninth grade. I can remember it would keep tickling my leg and I'm sitting, you know, in one of those little hard bench chairs years ago and with the little desky thing. And, you know, it just wouldn't stop bothering me. And I actually kind of forgot where I was and I forgot about everybody in the room. And I got so annoyed with it that it wouldn't stop. I slapped at it and I slapped so hard. I slapped myself in the leg so hard. I literally fell out of the chair onto the floor <laughs> and everybody's just kind of staring at me. You know, and it's how, like, how do you explain what's going on? You, you can't really explain that. Were you aware so, that it was like a demon and a familiar spirit at that time that was annoying you and pesky you and bothering you? I don't think I understood that it was a familiar spirit or a demonic spirit. Um, you know, I, it was just, I knew it was a spirit. You know, I didn't understand what I had been dabbling with. I mean, with the Ouija board and the seances, I did understand that the name of Jesus stopped when I felt evil, you know, and I didn't always feel the evil. So, you know, I didn't associate it with evil except for the bad dreams and the times when the crosses would come at me and the weird dreams would happen and things of that nature, which was more when I was moving away from it and out of that. So, um, but I had gotten involved. I mean, I, I was a typical teenager. I did a lot of drugs. I did a lot of drinking. I did a lot of smoking, you know, rebellious. I used to steal a car in the middle of the night after my stepdad died and drive up to town, which was like a half an hour away, just so I could go hang out with my friends because my mother was so strict. And one day she woke up and found the car missing and got her sister to drive into town and they found the car and I come back to get the car and it was gone. So I ended up staying away for like a week and when I went back she beat the crap out of me so you know that was when I was 16 and then when I was 17 I ran away again I had totaled her car in between there at one point and walked away from the accident I mean I literally flipped the car um and I just wanted it was just bad I mean I needed my mother my mother needed me to help her run mm -hmm. you know run the business after my stepdad died and I needed a, a loving, nurturing mother, and I didn't have that. And we just collided big time. So I ended up telling my dad, look, either you let me come live with you, or I'm just going to disappear, and neither one of you are going to ever see me again. And so he let me come and live with him. So I was 17. Yeah. God woke me up uh, one day back in 2000, and he just kept impressing. This is after I had come back to him, and he had kept impressing me to go visit my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And she had had several bad strokes the year before, and I didn't know about the, I knew she was kind of a cold person, you know, in terms of personality-wise. She wasn't like overly friendly and bubbly kind of person. But um, I used to try to make a point of going and visiting her whenever I returned. She lived in New York, whenever I returned in the area to visit, and I would always make a point of going and seeing her. And her getting uh, communion on Saturdays from the priest in town was very important. So she never wanted a visit during that time. And I knew how important that was. So by that point in time, she was in a nursing home. She had lost usage of basically most of her body. She had to be lifted and put into a wheelchair. Uh, she couldn't really talk. So I spent a week going through biblical you know, concepts, the Bible, my cousin who was born again, uh, came up and spent, you know, a few hours with us. And we went through scripture and talked about salvation. And I believe that she did get saved, you know, because I prayed with her and um, she, my cousin prayed with her. And But then later, before I finally left, you know, in the week, I was there a week and that was a Sunday. And I'll never forget this. I went up and I took some wine and some uh, crackers, and I told her, look, I know how important communion has always been to you, and although I'm not a priest in the Catholic Church, I am a minister of God, and I'm, you know, called by God, so 
I'm going to offer this up to the Lord. And if you want to take communion, all you have to do to let me know that is open your mouth and take it and I'll put it in your mouth. And she did. She took communion with me. Um, I left that afternoon and flew back down to Georgia where I'd been living. I was there like 16 years. And about a week later, she passed away. Wow. So, yeah. God. Well, I pray she's with the Lord in glory. Hallelujah. Let's go back to when you did not give your life back to Jesus again. You had mm -hmm. an, a total of 27 different surgeries and other yeah. health issues. I mean, you had a horse, 12, 1100 pound horse stomp on you. You had an encounter with a bull that almost killed you. You were beaten to death, um, literally by your ex-boyfriend. Let's start with the horse and let's go then to the, to the cat, to the bull. Well, and then the, to the well, the, the horse and the bull happened long after I was born again. Oh. But uh, yeah, um, that was just a few years ago, actually. In 2015, I was standing next to one of my horses about to give him a dewormer. So I was standing pretty close to him. And one of the other horses that antagonized hippie came up behind him and spooked him and he body slammed me. So I went about 10 feet through the air. I hit a metal gate and I hit the ground and I couldn't see anything. And then all of a sudden I felt a lot of pressure on my shoulder and my arm. And I heard this pop, 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 pop. and the pain just exploded. Um, he basically had stepped on my arm, you know, right in here and just pulverized it. It was in five pieces. Um, three sections were just completely crushed. Uh, it was part of the top of the bone was severed off and embedded behind my shoulder in the muscles. They had to dig that out. And then, of course, the rest of my arm bone hanging. So, you know, when people say there's the worst pain in the world is childbirth, I, I disagree. I, I can attest it's not the worst pain. This was the worst pain. And the doctor said I would never lift my arm above my shoulder, standing, you know, right here. And they said that they didn't know if they could ever put it back together. And God had a different plan. I spent a year and a half in therapy and, you know, praise God. God. Praise I can hold my arm up plenty. Wow. Hallelujah. I think this was, this happened before you were saved where your ex-boyfriend beat you. Yeah. yeah, you had a near death experience. What happened and what did you see when you died? And how do you know that you died? Well, I know that I died because the story that I, I shared it with this other lady one time and she let me know that her uncle had the same exact experience. And the only difference between him and me is he was in a hospital and he was on monitors and he went straight line and they lost him and they brought him back. And the, what he describes is exactly what I described to her. So that's how I know I died. Um, what happened is, you know, there was, he, when he punched me in the face, I, I, it's like I saw stars, everything went black and I saw stars and the pain was intense. And then all of a sudden it was like, I was out of there. I was out of my body and I was watching it from above. I was literally like floating in the sky you know, floating above my body, above my feet, and uh, like up by the ceiling, and looking down. And, you know, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So if you convert the thousand years to days, a day with our realm is as 365,000 days with the Lord. And so if you moved your hand really fast, I mean, like that was slow, but if you moved your hand really, really fast, your hand kind of disappears because you know and you can't focus on it so if you could you know you're in this time frame and if you're the time frame of the lord is 365,000 days faster in terms of a time frame uh speed then you know this is very slow compared to 365,000 times faster than that and you can't see it when I can move my hand as quick as I can. So you definitely wouldn't see it when you're in the spirit realm. So that's why when we are in this realm, we can't see the spirit realm unless God has gifted us with a very specific type of gift of sight. But when we're in that realm, what we're looking at is something that goes on in super slow motion. 
and everything was super slow motion. I was looking down at my body. I was watching it fall. I watched him. It was kind of like a being at the center of a piece of pizza pie. And you had that vision, that pie shaped vision. Um, all I could see, I could see him moving out from the edge of my vision, you know, what I could see. But my body was like dead center at the far end. I was watching it fall. I saw the muscles. Everything was in so super slow motion. I saw all these muscles in my face. I had no idea actually there to form the face. And it was like watching every single one of those tiny little muscles shift. And I, I can remember being amazed at how many muscles it took to structure the face. And I knew it was my face. I knew it was my body falling. And we had this couch that was kind of like a futon, pre-futons, where it had a crank in the back and it, you know, you cranked it forward a little bit to put it down to make a bed out of it. And I hit that couch and I can remember bouncing with that couch like three times, you know, and after the third time my body rested and I just felt a peace. Like when they say the peace that you can't understand, it was, there all around me. I mean, it's not like I saw Jesus. It's not like I saw, you know, anything else. I was watching my body fall and I was sensing a complete peace like you just couldn't believe, you know, and I had the sense of amazement. I could, I could hear the muffled sounds because everything was in such a difference in speed and in the dimensions, you know, and then all of a sudden, boom, it was like I crossed back over and I was instantly back in my body and in a great deal of pain and trying to figure out where I was, who I was. And I slowly pulled myself up and then I realized I was, you know, in the living room and there was nobody in the room and there had been a car outside with a bunch of people standing outside by the garage and I pulled myself up and I finally got to the door and there was nobody there. The car was gone. I finally made it out to the mailbox and I could see all the way at the far end of the block. This was in Mississippi. Um, the car was turning the block and, you know, crazy me. I took the guy back later, but, you know, after him begging and begging and begging, but um, wow. eventually, eventually we split because of, the violence that started again and then we didn't have anything to do with each other for years and then lo and behold long after i was saved he made his way to finding me online and um we ended up on the phone talking and in his own way he was apologizing for everything that had happened and um you know we we actually met one time spent some time together talking and um it was a few months later i think about six months later he ended up dying from cancer so he made his peace with me. Wow. You know, mm -hmm. you, you're so candid about how you, you know, you dabbled in witchcraft. You were smoking. You were using alcohol. You were even cutting your wrists not to yeah. talk to your mother. I mean, you were beaten have, to death. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I, I have my battle wounds and my scars from my childhood. I mean, I was 14 years old. I was, I don't remember what I did that I was afraid of going home. And I got a hold of a bottle of bare aspirin, you know, a large bottle of bare aspirin. And I ate the whole bottle of aspirin, 14 years old. You, you think I'd at least gotten sick? I didn't even get sick. I didn't even throw up. Nothing. It was like, wow. I couldn't kill myself. <laughs> and then when I was, oh, it's just so many things. I mean, I went down off, I was riding in a, with a motorcyclist, uh, well, a one percenter or a bandita at the time. And we ended up 85 miles an hour in the pack and this car basically hit the brakes right in front of us. And it was either try to scoot between two other vehicles and maybe get run over or take out the sand medium in Mississippi. And so we took out the medium and I came off the bike and I had marks on the top of my helmet because I had a helmet on and I took off the top of my shoulder. I slid a hundred feet or so. I slammed into a car. I left my hip imprint over the tire in the frame of the car. I had the tire marks from the bottom of the tire on my helmet. So I was upside down. I should have snapped my neck. Um, 
And I laid there for probably like maybe 10 minutes. And I finally kind of gathered myself together and I got up and walked away. And he wasn't so fortunate. He ended up having the black part of the grip of the handlebars rip into his thigh, rip it completely open all the way into the calf. And they had to literally take the handlebars off the motorcycle to take him to the hospital to have it removed because it was so well embedded. But, um, you know, I got involved with motorcyclists and all kinds of wow. scenarios that were not necessarily always good. Yeah, I, I remember my mom when I was a teenager warned me. The Lord told her to warn me. She said, do not get on a motorcycle. She begged me for two days in a row. I mean, it was out of nowhere. And I don't mm -hmm. know anything about the motorcycle. And then my this, this friend in high school who was interested in me, and I had a crush on him too, invited me on his motorcycle. And literally the last two days, my mom was, she grabbed me and, and begged me, do not get on a motorcycle, do not get on a motorcycle, whatever you do, never get on a motorcycle. And I remember he asked me a few days later, and I was so terrified by the experience of my mom basically throwing me against the wall and warning me not to get on. I mean, that was the Lord speaking through her. Wow. And I, I rejected it, the invitation that night. He went, he was going 90 miles an hour. And I'm sure he would have went a lot faster if I was on the back to try to impress me. And he turned and there was this wall he smashed into and wow. barely made it. I mean, he was in the hospital for a long time, a few weeks. And I can imagine. So thank you, Jesus. I mean, look, I'm nothing against motorcycles. If you're careful, you know, right. So if you, if you're careful, but for young, I wasn't people, always careful. I, I can remember going hundred miles an hour on my own. So I had several of my own. So yeah, me too. I, 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 I won't. I had a few, uh, I don't want to say daredevil, dare angel moments in my life, but thank you, Jesus, for protecting me. So I want you to talk <laughs> about your encounter with the Lord. Like what finally brought you to go to the Brownsville Revival? I want, to, I want you to talk about how you even got there, but what made you want to come back to Jesus? What happened? I was, in, I was married at that time, and um, I, it wasn't a, it wasn't a great marriage, you know. I mean, today we get along. We get along just fine. Um, we even vacation sometimes together. We, we've met up to celebrate birthdays together. Uh, not my birthday, but his birthday and my oldest daughter's because they're right beside each other. And, um, you know, but our marriage just wasn't good. He was busy with his work and I was busy with the Lord and things just could have been a lot better. So we were in marriage counseling going to this church. And I wasn't walking with God at that time, but he wanted to go to this church because the people he worked for went to this church and it was not a denominational. So, I, you know, we were going and we started counseling with some of the elders on marriage and we gathered together one night and, and I had heard the terminology born again numerous times but I didn't really understand it. Nobody really explained what they were talking about per se. So I always had this question in my head, what's the right church? You know, there's a lot of churches out there. What's the right church? And it's kind of funny because this gentleman, he, you know, led us through a prayer of salvation, explained about salvation and, you know, what Romans 10 says, you know, that if you believe it in your Heart and you know you speak it from your mouth you'll be saved and then he also explained about you know in John 3 where Nicodemus and Jesus are talking and Jesus tells you you have to be born again you know it's it's a command you have to be born again you know or you're not going to see heaven and you know he was like well how can you get born again you know how, how can you go back into your mother's womb and Jesus wasn't talking about going back in mother's womb you have to be born of water and spirit and the water is when your mother gives birth and the water breaks and the baby's born. But when you're born of the spirit, it's a whole different thing. That's your, that's your second, you're born again. And, you know, he's explaining all this. And it's like, I'm like, oh, okay. And I said, well, how do you know that you're born again? You know, if you pray a prayer, how do you know you're born again? And he's like, you just know that you know that you know. So we all gathered hands and, you know, as mad as I'll get up at my ex at the time and, uh, my husband and we've said this prayer and I got done with the prayer and it's like, okay, I'm not born again. I, I, I know that I'm not. 
But it was weird because all of a sudden I had the answer to this question, what's the right church? And it's like, I couldn't even shake it. I knew, I knew the answer to that, finally. And it was weird to have the answer. And the right church was, what God showed me was, it was the front cover to the rear cover of the Bible. That's the right church. You know, the rest of it is, you know, doesn't matter. It's just, you gotta be in front cover to right, rear cover of the Bible, the whole thing. That's the right church. So I went home, you know, and I got up the next morning. I was getting ready for work. I was standing at my kitchen and I was staring out at the um, iris lead, you know, outside. I had been in the yard. We had bought this place not too long back. I was watching the iris leaves and I love irises coming up and there were no buds. And I was kind of, you know, imagining, well, I wonder what color they're going to be. And I just closed my eyes and I just said, God, I have really screwed up my life. You know, my marriage is screwed up. I mean, things have just gotten so screwed up. You know, I had a daughter that was um, just, you know, she was just a little bit old. I mean, Nikki was born in 91, and my other daughter was born in 1980, and her dad had died um, while I was 13, when I was 13 weeks pregnant. And I almost lost her, you know, at a couple of times, actually. But, you know, I was just trying to pull this family together and um, just trying to find my way. And I just finally said, God, just unite my spirit with your spirit. Help me lead my life. Help me lead it the way you want me to lead it. Because I'm not doing too good a job here. You know, I, I need you. And, you know, I had this prayer and it was just me and him. And I opened my eyes and I'm looking out the window and there had not been any buds on the plants. But the first thing my eyes caught vision of was this fully developed, fully open yellow iris. And I was just, it something stunned me, something like, it, it, I was just amazed. I was just like, caught up in and and i wouldn't say necessarily into another realm or something i just was like something happened and i knew something happened i couldn't put my finger on what was it but when i saw that yellow iris i knew that i knew that i was born again and i didn't understand what that meant but i knew that it was good and i drove to work and the sky looked bluer and the ground looked you know instead of just dirt it looked really rich and brown and Everything, the grass was greener. I mean, everything just took on this like miraculous feel to it. And it was just wonderful. And, but it was a few years later when I felt the call of God in 96 to come into ministry. Mm -hmm. And then it was 19, it was in 1996 when I felt that call. And in November of 1996, I talked to my ex-husband and I talked my, it was my husband then, of course, uh, into going to Brownsville because I heard about it yeah. and I thought, this is wild. I, I, I need to experience it. We had a couple people, you know, that wanted to go and I'm like, we need to go. And he wasn't really, he was more like from the Baptist side of things and hadn't really, you know, wasn't really open to the spirit. Now I was open to the spirit realm because I had opened myself up to the wrong side of it. And I was learning about this. I had gone through deliverance before this. I, I gave my life on April 26, 1993. And it was, it was June of that year when I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I started to speak in tongues immediately. And I had a prophetic word spoken over me by a gentleman, Pastor um, Chuck Hall. And he said, that I would, I would operate in all of the gifts of the spirit and um, that I would operate both within the walls and outside the walls of the church. And um, I'll never forget that because I just never will forget that because the responsibility of doing that, of being able to do that, it's yeah. such a high level of responsibility. So anyhow, so I get my ex-husband down to Brownsville yeah. and and you had, by the way, a powerful encounter with God there. So I'm excited for you to share what happened at Brownsville. There was a lot happened at Brownsville. The first <laughs> encounter in November of 1996 was um, just eye-opening. 
uh, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to hope for. Uh, I just needed more. I knew I needed more of God. And I needed, I mean, the first two years after I was saved, my Bible literally fell apart and I had to have it rebound because I read it so much. Um, but, you know, I was just trying to devour it and figure out what do you want me to do with my life? And what direction do you want me to go? So we went and the, you know, the altar call occurred and we both went down just to, basically I was rededicating my life. I don't, you know, I'm assuming he was doing something of the same. Uh, and then we were standing there and there were all these people around and they started coming out and praying for people and people with pearl, you know, badges, purple badges. And John Kilpatrick, the pastor of the church, was coming towards us. And there were a lot of people slain on the spirit, you know, which Terry wasn't exactly as familiar with that, I would say. I don't think he was as familiar with that. And um, I don't think he was that comfortable. And I saw the look on his face and I kind of locked my feet in the ground so that he couldn't get past me to get away from John Kilpatrick. And, you know, Pastor Patrick Kilpatrick came along and there was a guy standing on his right and on his left, you know, uh, my husband and he prayed for the guy on the right and then he skipped to my husband and he prayed for the guy on the left and John Kilpatrick kept on going. And I stood there and I went, Lord, I wanted him to get prayed for so bad. I just wanted him to have the same encounter and same relationship. And, and then it hit me how manipulative I had been. And manipulation is not of God. Manipulation is witchcraft, plain and simple. So it hit me in my spirit that I had even though I had gone through deliverance to, to break all these ties of all these things from that had had a hold of me when I was a child, you know, when I was a teenager, when I dabbled in the witchcraft and everything, I was still operating in witchcraft because I was manipulating the situation, trying to get him prayed for, you know, I mean, how many women wouldn't want their husbands to be prayed for by an anointed man of God, but he just skipped right over him. And, I don't know what happened with Terry. I I closed my eyes. I was so sick of my, you know, sickened by it. And I closed my eyes and started to repent and raised my hands and just started praying and asked God to take it away from me. I didn't want that in my life. Just take it out of me. And it was kind of weird because I had no idea what to expect. I was just praying. And all of a sudden, I kind of like heard this wind and I, I opened my eyes and looked up because I felt like I was being stared at. And I looked up and I watched like I had a vision where the ceiling just peeled back off the church. And I saw the night sky and the stars. And I heard the wind and it like, it's like I actually almost feel like I saw it. It's like I went whoosh. And it hit me on the top of my head. And when it hit me on the top of my head, it was like frankincense and mirth and all this stuff in the water just flowed down all over me. And the next thing I know, I went splat. It was like a wet washcloth being dropped to the face of the earth. And I just, my whole body just went straight down. I hit the floor and I went and got, ended up in a roll. I mean, I wasn't doing this. I ended up, my body rolled itself up into a birthing position. And I laid on that floor for three hours in a birthing position. And there were times where I tried to get up and I could not get myself off the ground, off the floor. I just stayed down there praying that this power of God was all over me. The, the anointing was all over me and the glory was there. And, um, he had to, my husband had to go get three ushers from the church to come with a wheelchair after about three hours. He just left me there. I mean, I guess he didn't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what he was doing. I never asked him what he was doing during that time, actually. They came with a wheelchair and the four of them, basically, they got me into this wheelchair and my body was still really super heavy and I could hardly, I, I couldn't walk. They get me out. We the people had a van that we had ridden with and they got me up into the back seat of the van 
And when we got to the hotel, he opens the door thinking I'm going to come out and just walk to the hotel room. And it just didn't happen. I, I slid out of there so hard and so fast that I next to, we almost both hit the floor, hit the ground outside of the van because, and he, yeah, he had to catch me and he wasn't expecting that. And, and shuffled me into the hotel room, you know, and that was the beginning of my many, many, many trips to the Brownsville Revival. I used to pay for people to go just to get them there, just so they would go and experience it. And I would haul my kids with me sometimes. And most of the time we get down there and I pay for the hotel, I pay for their food. You know, we would be online at 5 36 in the morning. I mean, one time I went down there and we had gotten in about, I don't know, maybe two o'clock in the, in the morning. You know, we had transferred from Georgia time to Florida time, you know, central time. And we got into a hotel room. So I got a couple hours sleep and I had set my alarm to get up. And the Lord woke me up really like 4.30 their time and I, or 4.30 my time, 5.30 their time. And he started speaking to me and told me that they were going to take testimonies. And when they started to ask for testimonies, that I was to raise my hand because I was going to give a testimony. He, he wanted me to speak. And I'm like, okay. So I get, you know, get to the church and you had to be there early. You know, if you weren't there by six, you probably wouldn't get in the main building and you'd be in the overflow. So we got there really early, um, stayed in line all day. It was just a, it was just a big Holy Ghost party, you know, everybody would be praying for each other and studying and reading and, you know, sharing. And um, I can remember telling people, I'm, the Lord told me I'm going to get called for testimony tonight. And sure enough, we got in and I sat down on the far left side on the fl main floor. And John Kilpatrick got up that night and they didn't do testimonies every night, but he got up that night and he asked for testimonies. And I raised my hand just like the Lord told me to. And Sure enough, I was one of five people that were called up, and I was the only woman that he actually called up. And it was a powerful testimony, you know, um, or at least that's what people say. They still have it on video out there. So Wow. And you had an encounter with an angel as well, in, yeah. which is in the Bible. Amen. So why do you share about that as well? That's a cool story. Oh, gosh. You know... He called me to the ministry and, and in 1998, he called me to something very specific. And he called me to it through this angel. And we know it was an angel now. We didn't know, I didn't know it at the time that it was, I was encountering an angel. I had uh, gotten to the place where I had, um, I was assisting with people that gave their lives to the Lord because, you know, every single night there was at least a thousand people at the altar. And so I would, was at a place where they were letting me help out by handing out, you know, literature and talking to people about, you know, get in, get, get familiar with the book of John and things of that nature and get involved with a local church, things like that to encourage people. So after that, I, that was usually around nine o'clock or so when the altar call occurred. So they would do music and sometimes they would do music for three or four hours. You know, sometimes it was 12, one o'clock in the morning when we left. So I got, I was behind the first set of pews standing in the big open aisle and I was just praising God. I had my arms up and I'm just praying and praising the Lord. And I got a tap on my shoulder and this little, I turned around and this little short plump black woman was staring at me and asked me if I wanted prayer. And she had a purple badge on because all of the prayer team for that church would have, wear a purple badge. But they also had some rules, like they didn't pray anything specific. They only prayed like for God to give them more, you know, give you more. They didn't get into specific prayers and prophecy. Um, they didn't pray for people unless there was another prayer partner with them that had a purple badge in case somebody got slain the spirit to kind of catch people. Um, and they didn't have to take and go around and ask anybody for prayer because they usually had a row and lines of people all over the place wanting to be prayed for. And I didn't even think about any of that. I just, I was busy worshiping the Lord and she tapped me and I turned around and looked at her and she asked me if I wanted prayer. And I just said very quickly, no, I'm, I'm good. You go pray for a new convert. And I closed my eyes and I put my hands back up and I started praying again. 
And she taps me again and starts talking about Victorville, California, which is where my oldest daughter was born. And I mean, I'm in Pensacola. I've been living in Georgia. And she's talking about Victorville, California from, you know, like years ago. And so she kind of caught my attention. And I was like, that's really weird. And I turned around and I looked at her and turned around with, you know, sort of my back to the pew. And I'm looking at her and I started to speak to her. And then it was really weird because, you know, you had these black pupils in your eyes and it was like she had this little flicker of blue light that went into her eyes. And I'll never forget what I said to her because it didn't even make sense to say what I said, but I said, do you know the light shining out of your eyes? And she looked up at me as firm and stern and just serious as you could be. And she very blatantly said, do you know the call on your life? And I looked at her and everything in me went, and I was like, uh, yeah, I think I do. And she's like, do you accept it? And I'm like, well, yes. And she's like, well, raise your hands and pray with me, pray after me. And these are all the things that they're not supposed to do. The, you know, the prayer warriors with the purple badge. And I didn't even think about it. I mean, I was so captivated by the present. Her, her presence was so commanding. And so I said, okay. And I closed my eyes and I raised my hands. And as she prayed things and I listened to what she said, in my head, I'm analyzing everything she's saying. And I'm like, okay, I can agree to that. And I would speak it. And then she'd say something else. And then I'd think, yeah, I can agree to that. And I'd pray it. And it was a pretty long prayer. And then when she got done, I opened my eyes and I looked down at her and she looked up at me and she went like this, like she was raising her hand right in front of my face. And as she raised her hand in front of my face, she got like about there. And I felt like a lightning bolt hit me in my head. I mean, just bam. And it had to, I was hours, I was out because it was around, it was after midnight when I finally came up off the floor and it was about time for everybody to be shuffled out and, you know, ask people to leave. And that had happened shortly after the um, altar call. So, you know, it was hours and I woke up and I didn't even know where I was. I mean, I had no idea that I was even at the church. I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't remember where I was, nothing. And it's like, I got up and pushed on my elbows, you know, because I was laying flat on my face on the floor. And I went to push up on my elbows and I slammed the back of my head in the bottom of the pew. I was literally tucked up on, I had been facing away from the pew. I found myself tucked underneath the pew completely. I was like out of the way of anybody stepping on me. I was completely tucked up under the pew. And when I finally came out of there, it was like, oh, wow. So, you know, the next couple of times I went down, I'm looking for this woman. You know, I'm constantly looking for this woman. And because I wanted to speak to her and it was so powerful. And I could never find her. And then finally I was down there. And after everybody went and left the church at night, most the time, a lot of us would go to Denny's and we would have a holy roller moment in Denny's. I mean, people would be laughing in the spirit. People would be getting saved. People would be preaching. People would be talking about their experiences. I mean, the power of God was all over Denny's. And in comes a whole bunch of people wearing a purple badge. And I was like, yes, I am going to find out who this woman is once and for all. And, um, I go up to them and I start telling them what I just told you. And they're all looking at me like, and I said, I just want to talk to her. And they looked at me and they're like, well, we've been on the prayer team since it was, you know, started. And there's never been a short, plump black woman on the team. And we all about the same time just looked at each other and we went, oh my gosh, it had to be an angel. There were so many miraculous things after the Brownsville you know, initial Brownsville event. And the years after that, it's just, I started a home church, you know, under direction from the Lord. I had a home church for three years. Um, 
I ended up uh, on the, the pastor for the rehab ward at the hospital. Um, of course, I was going back and forth to Brownsville. And um, he sent me down to Belize after I got ordained and told me to go to Belize. I had no idea where I was going. I just knew I was supposed to go to Key Cocker. That was a little tiny island. And so I hauled a suitcase full of Bibles in Spanish and uh, one with clothes. And I came back with no clothes. I came back with no Bibles. Uh, while I was down there, there were two churches on this island. And it was a, um, there was a Catholic church. And then there was an Assembly of God church. And it's kind of funny because the Assembly of God church, uh, people from the church I was attending at the time actually had been involved in building that church. And I didn't even know it at the time, but he sent me there and I spoke to the pastor. So he invited me to preach and I started, you know, I, I started speaking and he would translate and all these people started crying. And I was like, okay, God, what are you doing? And all these people were crying and I was just like, wow. And then he asked me to go visit this guy that was a local drug dealer. And I said, sure. You know, so we went and he was translating. And what I didn't, we didn't know, they had been praying for this guy for a long time. A couple of days before that happened, the guy had been out on his fishing boat and God knocked him down with a bright light. It's like he had a, a, an encounter with the Lord and this big bright light and it knocked him to his feet. And so by the time we got there and I started sharing with him and things of that nature, he was ready and he gave his life to the Lord. And the evidence of that change was, it was so evident a few days ago, you know, later when I went to visit them, but there were so many things like I would visit and get invited to share at like a ladies groups. And, you know, I was at this place to share my testimony, share what was going on in Brownsville and, you know, encourage people to go. And I had gone to the ladies' room. I came through these French doors out of her dining room into the kitchen. There was a woman standing at the kitchen table. And as I stepped into the room and got close to her, she hit the floor just like, boom. You know, just like I had hit the floor. It was just like, boom. And she looks up at me and she says, can you please back up? It's coming through you and I can't get up. And I was like, okay, you know, all these things are like so new to me. And you know, so when I did share and then I prayed for people and people started falling out, you know, I was like, oh, wow, God, you know, you're actually doing this and using me to do this. And it's like, what are you, where, where are you taking me? So I was always ready for whatever he wanted. But the thing is, it's been 25 years now. And I just knew in my being that God was beginning to move me into this ministry that he'd called to me to when I was at Brownsville. And I got back and I started thinking about Steve Hill and I started about his wife and I was wondering what she was up to. So I looked up Jerry and she had this um, women in revival gathering that was going to be going on in Alabama where they used to live in September. So I signed up for that. And it was like three in the morning when God kept waking me up and, you know, having me get back online and look at the, you know, services and things like that just felt so drawn to it again. And so I signed up for that. And that summer he said, claim your neighbor's property. And I had asked my neighbors about leasing their field because they had a pretty nice field in the back and I needed more land to rotate my cows on because I was increasing in cows and they were like, no, we're, we're happy with it. Just like it is. We don't need you to fence it. We don't want to let you have your cows on it. We just like walking it and we're going to die here. This is our little space. And I said, okay. So I claimed it when he told me to claim it. And I said, you know, Lord, if you want it to be in my hands, you put it in my hands. I forgot about the prayer. I went to the re you know, retreat that September, I came back and two weeks later, my dog went after her dog. I went over the fence, I dragged my dog away. She's dragging her dog away and she looks over her shoulder and she says, oh, by the way, you know anybody wants to buy my property? And I just looked at her and I'm like, what? She said, you know anybody wants to buy the property? And I'm like, you know, I'm interested in your property. Two weeks later, we had a contract. They never had a for sale sign in the front of the place. Wow. Um, it was just miraculous. So I was like, okay, well, Lord, what do I do with this extra house? You know, I mean, I don't need it. What do I do with it? And he was like, 
you're going to use that for ministry. So I've had retreats there. I've had a lot of ladies retreats there. I've had gatherings with ladies and men. Um, the past year, we've been kind of out of commission because there's a period of time where I let some people live in the house for a little while so they could relocate. And then unbeknown to me, I had a water leak that was happening in back of my shower. And I ended up having to have my house completely remodeled after it was only three years old. So I ended up having to move into it and I've been living in it and I'm just now starting to get, move myself back into the other house. So once I do that, it's like God showed me he was washing my foundation. He was washing the foundation of the house that I had moved into. He was washing out all the people that had touched my life in a negative way. He was washing all of that away. Um, he was separating out people that didn't need to be in, you know, involved in any way, shape or form. And because the prayer has always been, Lord, you take whoever you want out of the picture and you bring whoever you want involved in this ministry. And he's been doing that. Um, so once I get done, it's kind of funny because as I'm going along, you know, I've got different people I'm meeting with the builders and this and that. I mean, the floor guy, the guy, the guy that did my floors, I ended up praying with him about getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I ended up praying with the painter and, and I mean, just so many different people that I've met. And a number of them are interested in coming to the gatherings when I start gatherings. And I'll do the same thing I did when I had a home church in Georgia. It was always under God's direction. We always had a meal to start with, and then we went from the meal to either worship or prayer. You know, we'd let God lead. We let the Holy Spirit lead it. And sometimes we were in prayer the whole time, and other times, you know, we were, it's just, it's whatever God wants, and he leads it. And I mean, I, we've seen people at the house that just were very inwardly quiet, and during the whole gathering, you know, during the whole day and ask if anybody wants prayer. And they sat down and we called it the hot seat. And I can remember this was very, it was just kind of, it was good because she was so tight, you know, in her spirit. And, and so you could just feel there was something there that she was hurting. And, um, Lord showed me to go ahead and, and wash your feet. So I started to get a basin, started to get some water. And then he's like, no, oil. So I drop, I dump the water out. I go back, I get some holy oil. And I start, I asked her to take her shoes off and put her feet in the, in the basin. And I poured oil on her feet and started to rub her feet. And, you know, we just started praying for her. And all of a sudden she's crying like a baby. I mean, it just like broke. And whatever was on her broke and she started crying like a baby. And then she starts laughing in the spirit. And then this one starts laughing in the spirit. And that one starts laughing in the spirit. I cannot tell you how many awesome encounters we've had with God's presence being so strong in the house. And, you know, he, I wasn't even going to go to Miami. I'd been to the reawakening uh, event um, down in San Antonio. And that was miraculous because Leon Benjamin and I were on the phone because I was calling him about religious exemptions. We were on the phone and I asked him to pray, you know, if I could pray for him and he would pray for me. Next thing I know, he offered me a VIP pass. So I already had a pass to go to the one in Dallas. And, but I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go to San Antonio too. So he made arrangements. So I get down there and I had a pass and I met uh, Pastor Mark Burns and so many different people, um, and you, of course, and you know it's just been one miraculous meeting after another, and so I had been to two of these events, and I figured why go to another one? I mean, always oh, so much fun. Clay does an amazing job. I'm so thankful. So if you have not attended the Clay Clark event at mm -hmm. all. I'm telling you, it's worth the trip. Even if you have to drive, I mean, people fly in. I see people, familiar faces every month. I'm always like, I saw you in Oregon and Idaho and New York and here. So it's amazing. You guys definitely want to go get yeah. to, you can go to time to free America dot 
clayclark.com if you want to get tickets to Clay Clark event. The next one he's having is in August in Las Vegas. I will yep. be there. I, I don't know. I don't think Karen will be, I'll there. be there. No, I am going. Yeah. He Woo! told me to go. He told me to go to both of them to pray. Praise he God. didn't tell me to go to learn something. He told me to go and pray for people. Minister. Yes, I love it. Well, I will see you there. Karen, how can people reach out to you if they want to get in contact with you? Um, well, they can dial my, I live in Texas, but I have a New York cell phone. Uh, they could dial my cell phone, 845-893-9929. Or they can write me on um, Our Father's Glory House. Dot, yeah, it's Yahoo right now. So Our Father's Glory House at Yahoo. Our Father's Glory House at Yahoo.com. You can send Karen an email. Praise Lord, Karen. It's been a blessing. I'd love for you to just pray us out of this uh, beautiful God I would appreciate podcast, that. Please. And lead people to Jesus. Maybe they're, they're, they're feeling a tug in their heart. Why don't you tell them how to find well, Jesus? If you're feeling, if you're feeling a, 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 some sort of tug in your heart, as Anna put it, that is the Holy Spirit calling out to you. You know, that's the nudging of the Holy Spirit. And I would encourage you not to ignore it because I've, I've prayed with people when they felt that and several of them have died, you know, since then. And they were young people. I mean, it was just, you know, you don't think of somebody young dying all the time, but people are dying. And if you feel that tug, you, you need the most important thing, decision you could ever in your life make would be to ask God in. You know, and, and Romans talks about it. You, you have to speak it from your mouth. You have to believe it in your heart. So if you don't believe it, you don't believe in God, you don't believe that he sent, God the Father sent Jesus Christ to the cross to take up your sin, you know, once and for all, to give you a pathway. Jesus said, I am the you know, way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father, but through me, you have to, you have to connect with him. You have to connect with Jesus in order to get to know the Father and for the Holy Spirit to come back to you. And when Jesus was with his disciples, he breathed the breath of life into them in John 20. And that was their born again moment. But then he, when he died and he risen and he came back and he specifically told them, you know, he had specifically told them in Acts, do not go out from Jerusalem until the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So you need the born again experience and you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I can pray a prayer for you if you want to pray with me. I mean, there's no special prayer and the prayer itself doesn't really, you know, it's, it's what's coming out of your heart as well as coming out of your mouth. And you got to mean it when you say it. So let me just lead anybody that needs that and needs the guidance on how to go about that. And I'm just going to continue to pray for just a minute over anyone that's in the hearing of my voice. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, I know that I need, you know, if you're looking for a connection, if you're looking for that born again experience, then this is how I would pray. Father, forgive me. In the name of Jesus, I come before you and I ask you to forgive me. Forgive the actions, you know, that I've committed and, you know, that have not been pleasing to you, whether they were deliberate or not deliberate. There's things in my life, and, and I know that you, Lord, that you're, you're receiving me exactly where I'm at. I don't have to try to clean myself up because I can't clean myself up. I need you in my life, Lord. I need the Holy Spirit in my life. I need Jesus in my life. So in Jesus' name, I pray, Father God, connect my spirit with your spirit. Help me lead my life. Help me commit myself to you and just, you know, clean me up. Show me what you need. If there's people that I need to forgive, show me who to forgive. Help me to let go of things. Help me to forgive and walk in forgiveness and walk in love because you are God of love. Help me to walk out that love, Lord. Help me clean up my life. You know, if there's things in my life that are not pleasing to you, then, Father God, 
Lord God, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in anybody's life right now. And I just thank you, Father God, that you love these people. And you want people to wake up and to know that you are real. In the name of Christ Jesus, I bind up every demonic force and principality and power and spirit of evil that's been hovering over anyone's life that's got its claws in their flesh. When you're born again, your spirit's born again, but your flesh is still flesh. And if there's anything in anybody's flesh and they just gave their lives to the Lord or they just recommitted themselves, in the name of Jesus, I bind off the things attached to the flesh, the curses of the past, the curses of the generations. Father God, every demonic force and principality and spiritual realms, you know, of evil, command them to be removed in the name of Christ Jesus right now. You have no rights. And I call forth these people, Father God, that are giving their lives, that are recommitting their lives, that are praying with me right now. I call them forth, Father God, that your Holy Ghost would come upon them and baptize them in the Holy Spirit because we all need to take and pray that prayer that we would be empty of ourselves. Let us diminish and you increase and let you only, you can teach us. You teach us by your Holy Spirit and dwell them with the baptism of the Holy Spirit so they can move forward with what you show them to do. Let them hear your voice. Let them sense your being, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let it be powerful and mighty and let them see the miracles, Lord God. Let them know and have the 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 authority of God be taught to them by the Holy Spirit how to walk in the authority of God, Father God, and that this Satan is just, he's already defeated. He is already defeated. He's like a little mouse hiding behind a tree with a megaphone. And you, you got to stop accepting the fact that he's anything. He's nothing. He's nothing under the feet of Jesus. He's nothing under your feet. And I pray in the name of Christ Jesus that, Father, you will indwell them by your spirit and wrap your love around them. Protect them in the name of Jesus. Draw them and direct them into the places that they need to be. And yet, and entwine their life with your, with the love of God. Entwine them. Teach them that what Jesus came to for them to learn through Him, to to, to connect with You, Father God, to do as He said. You love God the Father with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. You walk it out. You walk it out. You put you put feet to the ministry. You, you walk it out by the Spirit of God directing and guiding them. Lord, I just thank you for your presence. And I thank you for your anointing. And I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity. And I ask you to bless Anna. Bless her for allowing me this opportunity to give you glory. In the precious name of Jesus, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Karen, thank you so much. It was an honor for you to come on here and share your amazing testimony the Lord has given you in your life with us. So thank you so much. I'm sure we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.